Hello, everyone, and welcome to the HODLcast. Today is Friday, May 13th, and we have a very special guest, Jeremy Snyder, the CEO of BTM Compliance. Jeremy, thanks so much for, for being here with us today. Um, looking forward to our conversation all about you know Bitcoin ATM operators and the compliance in the space. Uh, let's get started with, you know, tell us a little bit about how you got involved in Bitcoin. Yeah, awesome. Well, first off, thanks for inviting me. Not sure if it was a setup since it's Friday the 13th, but <laughs> this is this is a lot of fun. Thrilled to be able to, to kind of talk to you about this. But yeah, um, so how I got involved in Bitcoin. I started off um, as an executive of a fintech uh, company for software. And I really just, you know, kind of started becoming really interested in Bitcoin. I hadn't gotten to the point where I guess you could say I wasn't like orange pilled at that point. It was really just more of a desire of curiosity to, to learn. And so I ended up spending a, a ton of time basically researching and learning about it. And then eventually I got to the point where I was pretty comfortable and then decided to go ahead and start making some purchases, or at least the purchases that I thought that I, I should be making. Um, <laughs> embarrassing enough, I think I probably started off purchasing, putting them in my custodial wallet, leaving them there, um, you know, after a while of making that and then probably even um, some small purchases of like eat, even before I even had fully understand it, you know, what I was going to use them for. Um, you know, I started making more friends uh, and that's pretty, you know, common in the industry. Everybody, you know, uh, I'm sure you have friends and we all love to, you know, to discuss cryptocurrency, but um, they helped me. They helped me explain things. And then this really led to me um, researching the stuff that they were telling me. And so I started learning even more and more. And I wanted to understand, like, what might I be missing in here? You know, what are the different perspectives from different individuals, different people? Um, and, and what are those things that maybe they particularly omitted because it didn't really, you know, fit the narrative of what they were trying to tell me? Um, so, yeah, so that's kind of how I got started. I really, that was probably about like, 2018, 2019, um, right in there. And I would say I was probably pretty late on making any like real serious purchases. But yeah, funny fact though. We're I, so early, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, and I'm, I'm still doing it now. I'm, I'm making my, my regular purchases. But um, funny fact, I, out of all of that research, the one thing that I probably never really dove into because it was probably the one thing that, I just, I guess I didn't really think about it, it was compliance. Uh, I never really took the time to really dive into it as in depth as I am now. Um, I had some various compliance experience, uh, really more or less around like software technologies for finance um, and the technology side, like SOC 1, SOC 2, you know, auditing and, and things like that and following those regulations, risk management. Nice. Well, our mutual friend, Eric, is the one who taught me all about compliance back in, uh, I guess it was 2014 now, but yeah, I didn't know much about it either. And he, he had all the answers. To, but, he still does have all the answers. <laughs> at least, at least he has me convinced. Him. So when I have questions, he's, he's definitely a great sounding board, somebody that, uh, that I definitely confide in and usually can give me some, some great, um, perspectives as far as like, what did it start with and where are we at now? And what does he kind of see like as we start to go? And he's really quick to kind of point out and be like, oh, right. yeah, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's I'm, I'm probably, in, I don't know if he's like certified a genius, but I think he's probably close, <laughs> you know, just. God, he's got to be there. Yeah, yeah. And when you talk to him, you can really tell like he puts the pieces together of anything really quickly. So. Uh, even though he's not a lawyer, you know, by any sense, I still often call him when, when I have come up against something that I'm a little stumped with, uh, especially on the compliance side. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, his understanding as, as an engineer at that level, you know, really brings together the pieces, which, you know, helps you take the information that you know about, you know, the regulations and be able to apply it to the technology and and what it was actually meant to do and so i think that's that's really that that bridge point of what makes him you know such a valuable person with that information mm -hmm. 
And so as a CEO of BTM Compliance, like what, what is it like uh, in, on a day-to-day -day basis? What kind of challenges are you coming up against? And <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, being the CEO of BTM Compliance or just a compliance company in general, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of work. Um, yeah, the challenges are keeping up with, with the industry, you know, um, providing company vision, uh, really like watching like the overall um, operation of our business work and then you know discussing things with the team speaking with um, probably anybody that will listen and so it's it's a lot of fun but it definitely takes up a lot of time so you see like the work that you have to do but you also see that there's um, an educational aspect that you have to provide to people and then just the the daily like management of a business and that oversight um, it's a lot of fun, but it's definitely a lot of work. It's probably not for the faint part. <laughs> yeah, I'd say so. <laughs> and what, what in your experience makes a Bitcoin ATM operator successful? Mm, you want me to pick out one thing or you just want me to start listing them out? <laughs> Maybe it's a top, top three or five. <laughs> yeah, so I would probably say like, dedication to probably business these aren't passive income like generators um they have to be involved in like the operations much like i have to be involved in the operations of my business um you know like watching like customer service watching compliance um knowing like how to expand how to like safely expand and then i guess doing it really in like the right marketing timing um, you got to do really good marketing. This isn't something that you can just like omit marketing from, otherwise people don't know how to get to your machines. Um, but you also have to bring in, you know, those, those good repeat customers, those, those people who are making legitimate purchases and you want to, you know, to help further, you know, their cryptocurrency purchases. Um, like me, educating, you know, yourself, educating others uh, in that process. All those things, I think, really, you know, kind of come together and take an operator and build them into what I would say an enterprise, you know, business. Um, I think that that's, that's really the, the key recipe to the success. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. When my husband did the Bitcoin ATMs, he didn't market them very heavily. And I, from what I can tell from other operators that do that, it makes a huge difference in the in the transaction volume. But now oh, I'm yeah. hearing that Google is not allowing ads for Bitcoin ATM operators unless they have an MTL, which, you know, if they're operating in a state that doesn't require a money transmitter license from the specific state, it like really hurts their ability to to market it right now. I have heard that. Um, I've actually had several operators who have explained, you know, uh, that very, very experienced themselves. And it's unfortunate. It really is. Um, you know, that Google hasn't really kind of come around to, you know, to understand and really, you know, kind of take the time to, you know, figure out like, hey, uh, MTLs or money transmission licenses, they don't broadly apply to, you know, every type of business that it, um, does function in money transmission, like the Bitcoin ATM, um, and that there are a large majority of states that don't. Do this, so. Yeah, it's like they conflated the FinCEN registration number. That's what they should be asking for. But instead, they're asking for this state license that it's only required in a handful of states. So I think it's, a, you know, it's an oversight and just a misunderstanding, but it's really hurting a lot of operators right now. Yeah, that's actually a really good point. I mean, for them legally operating, I mean, obviously, you know, the Fed, it's, it's going to trump that state part. But, you know, the states they're not even focused in, in the compliance, you know, regulations there. I mean, while they, they do want to see that those things are present, they're really concerned about the consumer protection side of it. And I think that's kind of, you know, one of the things that is, um, you know, it's disconjointed between the feds and the state. And so they, they really need to kind of come together and, and put those things, you know, uh, into one or at least put together a well-crafted message so that way somebody you know on the legal side from like google can can understand that 
Yeah, totally agree. And uh, <laughs> I know you and I have talked about these, uh, the banking situation for Bitcoin ATM operators, you know, offline. But what's your overall impression of the, you know, what maybe just give an overview. What does it take for a Bitcoin ATM operator to get a bank account? <laughs> what's that process like? So I won't even sugarcoat it. It's challenging. <laughs> um, definitely, definitely challenging. Um, yeah, so... It's a little bit more than just the process. I would say, you know, much like Google, there's there's things that are or aren't really fully understand, you know, with, within the industry financially. Um, so like large commercial banks don't typically accept, you know, the high risk nature of MSBs, really any MSB for that matter, um, you know, across the board, but especially, especially, you know, ones that deal inside um, cryptocurrency or virtual asset transactions. And then, um, I would probably say that most operators also start trying to talk to banks like before they're ever even ready. Um, and, and they don't even have a full understanding of what their business, um, you know, compliance is going to have to be. And, you know, walking into a bank, you know, as a high risk business, you know, entrepreneur or owner, um, that doesn't that doesn't fare well for you when you can't answer the questions, you can't provide them with the information, you know, that is uh, likely going to be asked of you. And then um, I would say that, you know, beyond that, not all banks are even created equal. So, yeah, you have large commercial banks that don't want to do anything with you. But there are, you know, um, your local, you know, community credit unions that, you know, do probably a better job of rather than just saying, hey, we're going to deny you based on your risk. And say, you know, well, hey, let's go ahead and let's take a look at like, how is your business? Because not every Bitcoin ATM operator is equal either. Um, and neither is our compliance based on risk, depending on, you know, who wrote their, their um, AML program. So those things, you know, kind of all come into play. But I mean, I would say, you know, generally, if an operator has, you know, done their own research, they have a business plan uh, and they've decided that they want to do this business. And then um, really, you know, they go through the process of getting registered, you know, with FinCEN. They have their AML program. They have their state licensing or um, if they don't require that, that MTL for state licensing, they have had no action, no opinion letter on file. Um, now they're ready to start, you know, looking for that banking. They're ready to go in and have that conversation you know, provide that information. And, um, and then the last I would say is just understanding your options in bank. Not all the banks are the same, you know, some people will provide you with a traditional, you know, featured like fiat style bank account, debit cards and checks. Then you have others that are like, you know, what? I, we can't do that for you. We can do cash vaulting um, through a different type of service. And then they provide you back things, you know, in like crypto. So there's, there's kind of, two different tracks there. Yeah, yeah. A couple of banks have been very innovative, like Bankline, Bankprov, you know, and so, several other bigger ones in the state. But for the Bitcoin ATM operators, I'd say those two banks are, you know, kind of the main ones I hear of operators using anyway. And, yeah. uh, you know, I think they're, they're doing very well. And like, there's a lot of, you know, cash flow moving around in this Bitcoin ATM business. And it's, uh, you know, it must be a great business model for the banks that have, you know, have offered the services and it's crucial services. So it's uh, at least there are the, you know, the two good ones out there. Yeah. And I know I'd there's also, more than two, but those are just the main ones that I, I know of, or I've, you know, have worked with. Have experience with. Yeah. I also have some, some experience with Surety Bank um, and they also do the same, but again, not, not all the banks, um, you know, require some of the same things or not all of them have, have the same features. So, Having that understanding, um, you know, speaking with your compliance professional, you know, or your your legal professional or your legal counsel to help kind of guide you through like, hey, this is what you should expect. Like, here are some some very friendly banking options. And here are the things that you're going to be asked. Some, um, you know, are more strict than others. Some of them, you know, have already accepted things like a BSA um you know, rule that they have for them as a bank, but doesn't really apply to the industry or doesn't apply to the industry yet. Um, but you should know that before you go and start an application process, which is exhausted, um, you want to know that before you go in there. 
Um, so that way you know what you're going to have to accept to, because the banks aren't going to change. Um, the banks are going to tell you what they have to have in order to do that. And that could be, you know, let's say social security collection at $3,000. Um, it could be, you know, um, very specific EDD, uh, you know, requirements that you may not currently have in your AML program um, in regards to, let's say, things like uh, source of funds validation. And they may say, hey, you know, you can ask the question or you could get these documents, but we also want these things, too, to support that. And so you want to know that before you go. So, yeah, it, it's it's a challenge. It's not impossible um, by any means. But it does require you to actually know what you're doing before you go in and have someone help, um, you know, really guide you and, and, and help you, you know, along the way. Yeah, I think uh, the, my first bank account application on behalf of an ATM operator was it took so much back and forth. And now the process is so much more streamlined just from going through it. Uh, and I don't think there is a way to learn it other than just having to walk through it or or like you said, like talking to someone else that's been through it because, you know, it's so different than just going in to open up a regular bank account. Like there's so much uh, required of you. But Well, and you, you have an immense amount of risk too. I mean, um, you know, for everybody who, who listens to this podcast, if you're out there and you're about to do something like this, I would also tell you, you know, hey, you know, uh, know what you're in for before you go in. You could have a personal uh, you know, bank account with those people. You could have a business that's completely aside from this one that you're starting or even thinking about starting. Walk in and go and talk to somebody, sit down, and they put their hand on your shoulder the second they find out that you're an MSP and you're doing in crypto, walk you out of the business, tell you, hey, please don't come back. And then next thing you know, you're receiving, you know, notifications that your other accounts are being closed down. Because now they see like, hey, there's a potential risk. This person, if they do start this business, could do things that, you know, would be very undesirable for the bank. And now they're going to just unsupport you as an individual for every type of account uh, and business account. So, yeah, it's it's critical. You really probably want to find somebody who knows what they're doing before you go off and start having this conversation. Yeah, I, I even had my one of my my old law firm DLT law group um, got its bank shut down because it was, it, we were not an MSB, you know, we were a registered law firm with a trust account, but we, you know, we were accepting money on behalf of not even an, an, another company that was not required to be an MSB, but taking wires in for them, but their name had crypto in it. And uh, anyway, they shut my whole or our whole trust account, regular account, personal accounts. We were just told like, get the heck out of here. And when I was asking them why they're like, Oh, you know, we treat these the same as like, uh, you know, sex worker accounts. <laughs> like you're telling me you treat our law firm, like a strip club, like account. And they're like, well, if it's dealing in crypto, that's the category it's going, that's the bucket it goes in for us. So I was like, okay, well, anyway, we went to another bank that you know, worked out. They were glad to get out of the business and Chase actually. Chase is, a, uh, they've been a good bank for even, even Emma, even crypto people working in Bitcoin ATMs and stuff. The, uh, oddly, they let people keep their accounts um, until they get like, wa even once they have MSB registration, sometimes they're not, uh, they don't have proper MSB accounts with them sometimes like operators, but until they get their proper yeah. uh, MSB account, Chase seems to be like a good bank to, to work hmm. with. Um, they're not kicking people out anyway. Um, interesting. Yeah. It's, it's one of those things I, I always tell, you know, anybody who comes to us for a consultation, I'm like, if you go into the banks, I give them the same spiel that I kind of gave you, you know, here's the stuff that you should know going in. Here's the research that I want you to do before you before you have those conversations. But when you go in and they ask you about your status as an MSB, you know, don't lie. You need to tell them. You have to tell them. Yeah. Legally. You don't want to be committing that, that, you know, that type of crime. And, uh, you know, and they're like, wow, yeah. Um, you know, or they may just say, you know, I'm going to put my money here. And I'm like, no. Nah. Do what you can, I guess, until you can get your other bank account. But, you know, there's there's ways to handle it. Um, you know, but again, it's it's legwork. It's not for the faint of heart. It's not easy, but it is mm -hmm. definitely accomplishable. 
and the banks have the minimum requirements too. Like they don't want to take you on unless you're doing 300 grand a month or you have a million in an account. So yeah, as someone's like ramping up their business, it is really like a tough spot to, cause you want to grow your business, but without a bank account to handle the transactions, it, it, it can be pretty challenging, but, uh, I'll give you a really great example. Um, you know, it's more like the chicken or the egg. So here's here's one. The state of Florida, obviously, with you know Florida versus Espinoza, and um, you know the the whole appellate, you know, third appellate court and their decision, you know, obviously changing things. It required all these operators to have to go through this this process of applying for their MTL. And the newer operators that are out there, they're trying to, you know, to get their MTL, but they're also trying to get banking. And the banks are like, well, we need to see that you have your MTL. And the state's going, we need to see that you have a bank account. And so you end up with this with this conflict where it's kind of like everyone's going back and forth, at least here in Florida. Um, So we do see that. And, you know, there are solutions, you know, around that. And I'm, I know we're actually invited to, to join a webinar um, and I know we'll be talking about that, but like there's a difference between, you know, a traditional bank account and then those crypto vaulting services, which don't require you to have that. But in that case, that doesn't even work for Florida. That's a non-starter, at least it is today until uh, some changes are made. Yeah. Yeah. Luckily that rule changed you know, so that coming January, that shouldn't be such an issue. But have you encountered any, um, you know, what are operators that are starting now supposed to do? I I, I want one to come to me so we can send a no action or a request for declaratory statement, because I have a feeling the state is ready. And I, it's just a no, I, I have no basis for this. Like, it's just strictly an opinion. But I'm wondering if we send a no action letter, if they'll come back and say, yes, you do, or they'll say, no, you don't need a license right now we'll let you operate until January because the license process really takes I mean they say it takes three months but it really takes six months three months to get all the documents organized and together and then submitted and then another three months for Florida to review it which will take us to the time period that it no longer is required for BTM operators so I'm I'm wanting to write a letter and just say like this is you know a frustration of purpose because (laughs) it's you know by the time we get the license it's no longer going to be a requirement for this business model So um, anyone out there that wants to start operating in Florida, let me know. I'd be happy to write you an action letter. (laughs) uh, Well, I, you know, so this is, this is kind of what I generally heard. Um, I was told, you know, obviously uh, House Bill 273, it got signed. It, It was, it's been passed through the House. It's been passed through Congress. So it's literally sitting there waiting for uh, Governor DeSantis to apply his signature or to veto it. Um, And so for some of the operators that I'm working with that are actually, they've got some intestinal fortitude and they've actually applied for their MTL on their own um, and are are doing it rather well, they've received notification um, that has basically told them, hey, there is some pending legislation and you know that OFR was actually going to extend out you know their application you know again by 45 days um you know and that's supposed to give them this nice time window uh for governor DeSantis to really just make his decision on you know does he sign it or not if he signs it then yeah you're right um OFR has has to make a statement and I think that that's really what they're they're planning to do is that they're going to you know make a statement about how do they handle the unlicensed transactions that, that occur, you know, between January of 2022 through December 31st of 2022 until, you know, if he signs it, that that law goes into effect. So I imagine that they're going to give that guidance. Um, I would hope my personal opinion and my personal hope is that they might do something maybe like California has done where California, you know, I can't tell you how many times people are like, man, it's so awesome that they actually have the no action, no opinion. Yeah, they just post it right up there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in this case, you know, that would be something that I would think that would be very beneficial, you know, not just to the operators, but also to to the state. 
Uh, I mean, think about yeah, time and effort. Responding to these. I mean, when it was just money transmit or money service businesses applying were just Western Union or, you know, like a, yeah. a, a much smaller category. Now that it, with the crypto applications, they probably get 20 a month or I, I don't know exactly how many, but probably a lot more than they used to get from the time period of like 2001 until, you know, 2017 or so when it started to get really busy. Um, I, I imagine it's it's got to be it's got to be pretty pretty good. I mean, you look at statistically, you know, 2021 and the deployment. You know, I mean, this is what we do. So we're watching this. I mean, and we're helping operators, you know, operate their businesses, you know, legally and fully compliant. And so we are trying to, you know, just really watch this this progression. And I mean, this is this is really cool to to see that they're making these changes. And I would just hope that, you know, they would make some of these things a little bit easier for everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And then on the flip side of not wanting the license, like there are, you know, the, and the, I, the reason I think that Florida shouldn't have a license requirement for the money service businesses or the money transmitter license for Bitcoin ATM operators is because they're already regulated at the federal level. So it's just creating a duplicate of what's already taking place from the compliance side. But I, I do see the need for some level of compliance because of the scams. Like when I first came into the space, I was thinking, you know, my, my mindset was a little bit less on the compliance side. Like I just thought everyone should be allowed to operate independently of all these regulations. It's their choice how to, you know, I just didn't feel like the, the ethos of Bitcoin required, you know, KYC with it, or actually the, the KYC might ruin the ethos of Bitcoin because, you know, the, the whole idea of it is that it should be anonymous and it should be something that's unconfiscatable. And if the government knows that you have it and there's, you know, then they can come and take it. If, if, you know, some, something like when gold, you know, was yeah. t turned into that you had to go turn your gold in. Um, but, We've seen just, you know, in this Bitcoin ATM industry, a lot of different scams out there. And, you know, uh, sure, there's one, you know, side of it of like, you know, uh, do your own research and, you know, don't be the victim of a scam. You have some responsibility to, you know, take some steps to to learn what you're doing and what you're transacting in. But at the same time, it's like, wow, these scams, like it's, it's heartbreaking when you see people lose a lot of money. Oh, yeah, so, yeah what, what's, what's your, tell us about some stories you've seen. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess it's probably, beneficial for everybody to kind of know. I, I don't like to assume that everybody understands all of compliance, you know, to the nth degree, but I mean, scams are, they're a subset of fraud, you know, and fraud is, you know, really just misleading and deception and things that are illegal practices in general. And then the schemes or scams are the schemes that usually involve, you know, like money and then a business transaction. So knowing, knowing that, um, there are so many different scam types, um, romance scams, you have government and like law enforcement impersonation scams. Um, so what are those? What's a romance scam? Yeah. So romance scam would be like, you know, you have met somebody online. You've never really met them in person. You may or may have seen a photo, but you don't know that that is the individual that you're talking to on the other end of the line on the other end of a computer and next thing you know that person asks you for it could be something you know as easy as like hey uh you know i have a daughter and she needs some medicine or i have a medical ailment and i need some money for my medical expenses or hey i'd love to come visit you um why don't you pay for my plane ticket but i need you to send me money and then i'll handle all the rest and then next thing you know they're trying to you know facilitate a scam through, you know, through Bitcoin, through a Bitcoin ATM, um, because it's it's very, very easy for them to do that. It's also, you know, pretty easy for us to also identify those two. Um, I don't want to give away all of the trade secrets, but, you know, we watch for indications, um, you know, and we look at, you know, how that transaction is really coming through. 
and you know likely you know more information is is provided usually it's it's the wallet that really gives it away um if it's a new wallet it doesn't really matter for us you know we may see that that wallet you know came through a message you know rather than you know an originally generated you know um wallet or it's just as simple as you know asking because a lot of times if we have to get on a call with somebody we always ask them you know like uh who does this wallet belong to you know i was in law enforcement so we ask you know open-ended questions and so i teach you know our team here at btm compliance that's how we ask our questions you know to people um, you ask them you know very open-ended so that way they're not just providing you with like a yes or a no response they're giving you you know gold per se in information and then you're taking that as as a professional you know compliance uh you know individual and then you're applying you know what you know about the industry what you know about scams and so that works generally for for a lot of these um government you know impersonation and like law enforcement that could be someone saying hey i'm calling from the irs and you've you know we actually did a review and you owe us like an extra like five thousand dollars so we need you to go to your local bitcoin atm and we need you to go ahead and, and put this money in there um, you know or hey you have a warrant out for your arrest and we're calling from such and such sheriff's department and uh, next thing you know you're you're kind of falling for it because they do they they really they really work hard they're good at convincing you of, of their their scam and that's that's the scheme that they have mm -hmm. and um i wish you know, those scammers would work as hard as they do at scamming people at some legitimate business because they're they're all very like you know they're they've got charisma they make you believe them like they could do really great at you know legitimate sales or whatever else but yeah. well like hackers you know there are there are people who you know um ethical hacking you know they may have at one time you know gone down gone down that path where it was it was less than ethical and then next thing you know they're they're using you know what they learned and they're helping you know um you know fix things so I, I also like to think, you know, it's hard in compliance, you know, not to, to always look at things through through a lens of like everybody is a suspect. Everybody's doing something wrong. Um, there's a lot of legitimate people out there who want to purchase cryptocurrency. Why would we not embrace that, too? Um, so asking the questions, being friendly and having an understanding, you don't know if you're stopping somebody you know, from making a very, very big mistake and they're just, they don't know it. Um, I was on an ACAMS webinar just recently and they were talking about like these different scams um, that they had seen. And this one was just like in the financial industry, but this older lady had been contacted, you know, um, randomly. And this person was like, hey, we have this, this little girl and she's kidnapped. And if you don't pay this ransom, we are going to kill her. And this woman, you know, ended up making these these payments, these demands. And, you know, obviously when she also was trying to report this to law enforcement, they get involved. I believe in this instance, the FBI was actually involved. And even though the FBI had explained to this, to this um, you know, elderly woman who did, you know, believe the scam, she still believed it. Even though the FBI fully explained like, hey, this is a known scam. Um, and that's usually the problem with these with these scams, like romance scams. It's 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 pretty hard if someone's already made up their mind. You know, changing somebody's mind or persuading them, you know, to reason, it becomes very difficult. So mm -hmm. you know, we try to help them by letting them know, like, hey, we're not putting you know this transaction through, especially not to this wallet, because we know you have no control over it, and that's a requirement for us. Um, yeah. So you have to open up your own. And so sometimes they do open up their own. But at that point, we've made them aware that there yeah. are scams. We've done everything we can to help them, you know, uh, make a legitimate transaction. But what they do with their money, I mean, you know, as well as I know, I could send you money today. I mean, that's the best part about this is that I can send it to you, send it to you quickly, send it to you with very low fees. Um, and then you get it. So what they do with it after that is it's sometimes unfortunate. It takes a while for people to learn. So, mm -hmm. but yeah, there's a lot more scams than just that. I mean, you've got investment scams or Ponzi's. You have uh, inherited scams. You have secret shopper scams, advanced loans. I mean, 
there are so many different scams that are out there that you don't know which one's, you know, going to come and land on your doorstep and then you're really confronted with it. I get it on Twitter all day. I, I laugh about them. Yeah. 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 Um, when I used to work at the bank, like a TD bank, I remember this guy coming in trying to do wire to a Nigerian prince thinking he was going <laughs> to get some back. This was like in 2006 or something. And uh, I remember telling him, like I was sitting there, I'm like, you can't, this is like a total scam that you're just trying to send your money to. And it was 30 grand, like, and you know, it was everything he had in his account. And the guy was so convinced that he had to do this and he, it was a great investment. And, you know, our, I had to call the branch manager in and we just like told him, you know, you've got to go somewhere else to do this wire. We're not doing it for you. But it was like, it was so eye opening to me at that time of like, wow, this guy, like I'm sitting here, I'm telling him, absolutely sure that this is a scam, but he was so convinced otherwise. And I've seen the same thing in, in crypto, especially when my husband was a BTM operator, like I would hear, he'd be on the phone sometimes. And we had an old, older lady, um, with that, you know, saying someone told her they were going to kill her kids if they didn't send, if she didn't send the money. So she, you know, believed it and were there telling her like, call the cops, but it's, it's most likely a scam. And it was just like, I think that's why he got out of the, the industry to like, you know, for multiple reasons, but that one, that one call, like the lady was just so upset by the whole situation. And it was just like, Oh man, like it's terrible. But yeah, that's, that's, it's, that's difficult to deal with. Um, you know, there are particular, you know, individuals who obviously, um, you know, can be more susceptible to scams. So, you know, there's like elder exploitation. So, you know, yeah. looking at those, at those things in order to stop it, um, you know, becomes pretty important. Um, yeah. another thing that I would recommend to a lot of people is if you think that you might have been a victim of a scam, you know, you are, or there's been an attempt. Um, we also have the, uh, the three C's, the crypto compliance uh, cooperative, and they have a reporting tool and they've partnered up um, with another organization too, to kind of help with that. And, um, mm-hmm. those things, you know, obviously go over to law enforcement. And, you know, then they kind of help investigate that. And, and, you know, I don't know how much justice is always brought out of that. You know, it's always a good reminder to know that every blockchain transaction, (laughs) you know, once it's done, it's, it's there. Yeah. There's no hiding it. (laughs) There's no hiding it and you're not reversing it. So if you've sent out money and you feel like you've been scammed, it's, it's likely gone unless, uh, you know, someone catches that scammer, which is, is important, you know, from a compliance perspective like to flag those things help report those so if everybody does their part you know we help make this a a safer place for everybody to make uh you know transactions yeah for sure and then um so you know new york has the bit license so it's always been a bit of a challenge for bitcoin like pretty much i don't you know bitcoin atm operators uh, almost universally have just stayed out of new york but uh uh, I know you recently had some some contact with them. Can you tell them about that that process? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I've had a lot of people obviously inquire, and um, you know, as you probably know about me from the discussion we've had so far, when I learn something, I like to find out like all the information. <laughs> so. In addition to myself, um, our staff at BTM Compliance, uh, you know, we decided to go ahead and uh, create a Freedom of Information, you know, Act request. And so we did that knowing, you know, the New York uh, DFS basically has posted on their website that shows, you know, the different organizations that actually have this bit license. And there are a couple that are on there that actually operate, you know, within our industry. And um, so what I did is well, not me, but myself and uh, and our staff. We actually went through and, and we created this this foil request, sent it off to to New York, and it was really more a learning aspect for us to have an understanding of like what is required that, that comes out of that. Um, you know, I wanted to learn about like the process, um, the length of time, uh, the documents that are going to be requested. You know, just things like that, and yeah, we found out a lot. So New York, you know, obviously there's, if you're looking at different cases, especially criminal cases, uh, there is the one that like just came out like maybe a week or two ago. 
um, you know, of a Bitcoin ATM operator, obviously unregistered from, from, uh, from Vincent as a money services business and um, was actually, you know, catering to, you know, to criminal activity. And so that, that kind of, you know, sheds a light as to probably why New York is like that. And, you know, they go through this process of basically asking, you know, for an application, just like every other state's going to. Um, but then they really go beyond, you know, any other state and they ask for a lot of stuff. I mean, they want to see that you've had, you know, technical audits, um, you know, cybersecurity. They want to look at your, you know, your banking history and, you know, the length of time and the amount of things that as they kind of peel the layers of the onion back per se, you know, they learn a lot. And so they ask more questions and that process doesn't really truly have a finish line, in my opinion. Um, some of them, you know, are longer than others, depending on what was revealed as they kind of went through. Um, and then, you know, at the end, they, they really give them a lot of, you know, like regulations that they end up having to follow uh, for that license. And they haven't even gotten the MTL at that point, or maybe they had, and they, they, they you know, they applied for them both probably concurrently. Yeah, I think you need so, both. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm, I'm certain you have to have both, but I, I'm not sure if you can apply for one, you know, before the other, or if you just do them both at the same time. But I know yeah. you eventually have to show that you've, you've at least got the MTL too. Yeah. So I would say, you know, anybody who's really looking at this, I don't want to tell you or scare you away from it. Um, obviously, I think it's like banking. If you're determined and you want to do it, yeah, go for it. Um, but the things that I would probably tell people as my own personal advice would be like, is your business ready for that? Um, mm -hmm. You have to have, you know, the financials in order to be able to support that process. Um, <coughs> excuse me. You have to have the intestinal fortitude to kind of go through the length of that process and the amount of requests that are that are on there um, that I saw from, from three operators that, you know, had to provide a lot of information. Um, they did redact, you know, a good amount of stuff, um, you know, or at least omitted some things, but they did kind of tell you, you know, like we omitted this, 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 this. And so those things, um, you know, were, were things that were probably more proprietary to that operator's operation, um, you know, or things that may give like a business advantage or disclose a business advantage that someone might have. Um, mm -hmm. So those things were omitted, but generally speaking, you know, all the different types of audits and then, you know, going through a really hefty review of, you know, their AML for probably bulletproof in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's my that's my experience. If you're a small startup operator, um, I would say I'm not worth you know, it's, doing it's probably quite yet. not worth your time to start Although, going through that. On the to New York's credit, which I never thought I'd say these, the way my attitude has changed over the years. Um, but uh, oh, what's the company's name? There was a 222 page report done of the companies that have the bit license, the 10 of them compared to the rest of the exchanges. Um, it was done by uh, Teddy Fusaro's group and mm. uh, their name, uh, I'm going to have to like put it on the screen. Um, uh, but anyway, they did this amazing report that showed the quality of transactions versus the like uh, wash trading going on on various exchanges. And the exchanges that were registered in New York that had the bit license were like Gemini, Coinbase. Um, you know, I don't think Kraken had it yet, but there were there, there were ten that had it that that showed really legitimate transactions compared to all these other exchanges that didn't have that license and their transactions were bogus, which, I mean, I guess for the people operating in New York, like, uh, you know, maybe they were wishing they could do some of these swamp wash trading <laughs> and stuff. It might've been made them more profitable, mm. but over the long term, those exchanges are still around today because they're operating with, you know, within the same kind of rules that the stock market would follow or, you know, other, other legitimate businesses. So, you know, wow. they, they, they just, they have to operate with a higher level of integrity to their clients. And I think that in the long run, you know, creates more trust and more people want to use their exchanges as a result of having to, 
you know, to to live up to those New York bill license standards. So, oh, but like you said, it's it's not for the faint of heart, and it's not for a small mm-hmm. business. It's only for a business that has a you know a, a pretty significant revenue base that can can handle doing all those compliance uh, requirements. Yeah, and I mean, when you think about it too, most of the most of the startup, you know, Bitcoin ATM operators, they're some of them start, you know, and and really put a good serious start to it. Um, where they have like either multiple investors or they have the money in order to go in there and do those things. I wouldn't want to discourage anybody from you know from yeah. making those attempts, obviously. Um, but somebody who has like two or three machines, you know, I would just be like, hey, you know, realistic. This it's the state is is pretty difficult. Um, the standards, you know, or the bar is going to be set pretty high that it's going to be required for you there. And, you know, I'm not really sure that it's going to be a, a fruitful endeavor for you in the, in the long run. And like yeah. said, it's like the average MTL license could take, you know, three to six months, you know, from, from some states, depending on, you know, uh, maybe how backlogged they are and, and, you know, the completeness of your application on first submission. So mm-hmm. those things, I think, obviously play a role in New York. I think, you know, they, they have their is it hampering innovation? I don't know. Yeah, I I think that it's it's definitely um, something that I would that I would question. You know, does New York hamper hamper the innovation there, uh, and really only cater you know to to larger organizations to do that? Uh, that's probably more you know the optics that it looks like. But at the same time, you know, you also have these guys who are operating you know illegal operations there too. But they are getting caught, so that's good. We don't need these bad actors in our space. Yeah, yeah. And that that company that did the report was Bitwise Asset Management. Um, nice. <laughs> yeah, but they they put out some really good pieces. <laughs> um, you have to read that. So, yeah, I'll I'll send it to you. Uh, do you see like from your operators you can often see their transaction volume and everything like that uh is there a big correlation between bitcoin price and the btm volume you know you'd rather see when the price goes down more people going to buy or but uh do 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 you see a big correlation or um, yes and no i mean i guess this is this is almost like you know like doing trades so i would say you know, when it comes to the actual ATM, I can't say that, you know, definitively. There are so many different things that really kind of come into play. You know, I mean, it, it could be you just really don't have the foot traffic that comes through. You don't have, you know, um, the actual like cash business that would come through that business. Or maybe it's just poorly placed and it's not even open, you know, a lot. Um, so there's there's so many different things that, that really, you know, kind of play into like, whether a Bitcoin ATM is going to be successful or not. Uh, but as far as like Bitcoin price and volume, yeah, I, I think that there is a correlation between those things, uh, or at least they're, they're co-integrated. And I will caveat this. I'm not giving trade advice. I am not even a trader myself. I buy, I hold. That is really it. Same but, here. Yeah. yeah, I do see price and volume um, being co-integrated. So generally speaking, I would say like you see the price and uh, it's falling along with volume. Generally, that's going to mark you know like a point of uh, signaling that there's a reversal that's going to be happening. So, and then um, conversely, you know, a higher price and then that volume. Um, you know, that's going low, usually, you know, uh, leads to a drop in the price. At least that's an indication to me that that trend is weakening. And so, again, I'm not a trader, but, you know, I do see these correlations. I would like to watch it. I just, when I talk about intestinal fortitude, I don't have it for, for trading. It's just <laughs> not my gig. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've just done it poorly too many times. I started my career as a trader and I remember even then watching like anyone that held things for 10 years, they did so well. And everyone that was actively trading, like it was just, they weren't doing great 
you know, over a 10 year period, they would be yeah. almost the same. And then I, myself was trying to, you know, just being young and always thinking like, oh, I know best or whatever. I don't know why when you're, yeah. or for me anyway, when I was young, I always thought I, you know, knew everything. And the uh, instant gratification though is usually yeah. what, what gets people. <laughs> they they want to, they want to see that stuff, you know, happen fast. And for me, yeah. it's not, it's not a space that I, that I would play in, you know, I guess often enough. I mean, that's, that's something you're, you're sitting there, you're watching it, you're doing that stuff. And that's, that's just really not. Yeah. My sister day trades still as her full-time job. She just day trades on like these three different, um, uh, ETFs and she's been doing it for like 20 years <laughs> and she knows them, the volume and the, the, everything about them. And she just does it for like two hours in the morning, tries to make a thousand bucks and then she's off for the day. <laughs> Some people are really good at doing stuff like that. For me, it's just, you know, it's one of those things. It's like, uh, I just, I don't think I could do that. I don't think I could stand to have to try to watch, you know, through the different trends and try to, you know, read these, you know, these graphs and just try to yeah. you know, make these predictions and, you know, like anything else, it, it's inevitable. You're going to make a mistake. Um, you know, so mm -hmm. you, you don't know what that is going to be. Being I'm in compliance and being that I like to evaluate things based off of risk in general in probably all aspects of my life. Um, that's one that I just <laughs> endeavor in. So I buy it and I'm confident because I, I understand the technology. Um, and like Elon Musk, he, he, he would tell you to, um, you know, invest and do the things that, that you're passionate about and that you know. And, um, you know, for me, I understand and I know Bitcoin. And so that's what I invest in. And but I know it well enough to the you know, like right now. It's like, hey, here we are in a dip. And yeah, I'm not, I'm not sweating. I'm buying. Mm -hmm. and, you know, and I can be comfortable with that. Yeah, same. And it, it's, it's taken a few years to get comfortable with the dips. Well, I, you know, always it like, I, time, yeah. mm -hmm. but uh, you know, like where there's a big future for Bitcoin and this little dip in the road doesn't matter. Yeah. It's nice though, when you can go back and you can look at like the history and you can be like, Hey, we were just here in 2021. And, and it was very happened. exciting. <laughs> we and were very glad to be hitting 30K. <laughs> it, was, it was so exciting. So, you know, when you've gone through, you know, these, these cycles and, and you, you, you've been through that bear market and you know that there is an expectation that that bull market is going to happen. It's exciting. Yeah. So, you know, those, those who actually truly believe, I think that that's, that's kind of where they're at and, you know, the people that I would say that I talk to, you know, and I try to convert them. Um, yeah. Once, once they kind of hear that and they, they see it too, they can see that history. They're like, Oh, okay. I see why you say that. Mm -hmm. And not, not trade advice, just, just stuff that I see in my own personal. Yeah. Agreed. Um, and then, so what do you, what do you think of SARS and CTRs, the suspicious activity reports and the currency transaction reports? I think I read somewhere that I can't remember the number of hours, but the number of SARS and CTRs that were filed each year and the time that it took was like 10,000 hours of time or something, you know, something really crazy. If you think about it all over the country, all the people that are, you know, filing these things and then the oh, yeah. percent of crimes that are caught based on it, it seemed a little bit low compared to the number, you know, it was like less than 1% or something around that, that level. But, uh, what's yeah. the, but well, you know, what's the alternative or what, what, what do you think about them? Uh, especially with your, your background in law enforcement, you might have a unique perspective compared to the average Bitcoiner. <laughs> I, yeah, I guess. Yeah, I, I, I probably do. Um, yeah. So I would say, you know, obviously, they're federally required by the Bank Secrecy Act, and I'm in compliance industry. So I do see them, you know, probably differently from, from other people. But because of my background in law enforcement, I, that especially really helps me kind of see that. Uh, I spent, you know, 11, almost 12 years in law enforcement, um, you know, in narcotics and, and you know, uh, with HIDA task force and um, uh, the high intensity financial crimes area task force, too. And so I got to see, you know, different RICO cases. I actually purchased a lot of drugs undercover, um, you know, and 
and put a lot of people away, um, you know, into uh, into prison, you know, based on you know a lot of their, their actions or their poor choices. And so I can tell you that you know these these SARS and CTRs are are really important. Um, they're critical. They obviously play a role in reporting activity that actually leads to you know building cases like money laundering, um, structured transactions, and uh, you know hopefully not as much uh, terrorist financing. Uh, I know that that's always kind of thrown in there at the end. Um, you know, it's one of those things where it's it's you know the purpose of these reports is to report. That's the responsibility, you know, um, to complete them as a financial institution, um, you know, or as an MSB. It's not that you're trying to convict somebody. So, um, to report the nature of the activity and let law enforcement use them um, in their criminal investigations is is really kind of where it's at. I think that you know the question of effort about you know if law enforcement is like reading these when you see um, like the average bank. And the amount that, that some of these guys are actually putting in of SARS and CTRs, some of them completely like just trump things, um, you know, or another organization type. And then you also have, you know, MSPs and, you know, the smaller the MSPs doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have, you know, fewer SARS, you know, to, you know, maybe another operation that might even have twice the machines you know there's a lot of other things that kind of come into play with that you know like where is the machine located is it located you know in one of those high intensity drug trafficking areas is it in one of those high intensity you know financial crime areas um you know there's there's things that you may not even know about that you know that you're putting in you know one of these machines right around the corner you know from um you know a criminal organization and maybe they they want to get smart and, and try to do this ultimately i would say you know um investigators definitely look at it uh, again i'm also uh, our whole organization is a member of acams and so i join a lot of the webinars uh, you know not so much as a speaker but really as an attendee to kind of you know stay current and, and hear what people talk about and one of the ones that i recently was on was all about this exact topic and um you know my experience with them was exactly what law enforcement had shared they see these things um you have no idea if the person that just you know made a transaction and let's say they're structuring it you know um that they have an active case on it you might be providing like the key element to make a case for somebody that they're able to then take you know and prosecute on um it's got to give you a pretty good, you know, feeling in the end. But you know, they had folks from like the IRS, from FinCEN, um, the Department of Justice. They were all on there, and they all kind of mirrored exactly the same thing. They're like, "Hey, you never know when a report that you provided is, is going to actually give us, you know, that that next leg up. You don't know if it's something that we already have on. So file them. Um, they have systems in place that." They know who they're looking for. They know the things generally that they're going to be looking for. Just like in compliance, we have flags. So, <coughs> excuse me, um, those flags, as they look at those, that's going to, you know, pull that star out, you know, or that CTR a little bit faster and, and get that information in front of somebody. And, and it's probably credible. But another thing that they also said is if you see something and it really, really is, is something that you really want to point out, um, you know, report it, report it to, to your, to your law enforcement, um, and, and let them know. And then also, you know, make your report as federally required. And those things help. Um, you just don't know, um, you know, if you're going to be helping, you know, facilitate, you know, uh, tax evasion by allowing these transactions to go through. So don't do it. Um, drug trafficking, uh, weapons trafficking, human trafficking, sex trafficking, you know, some of those are, are really hard to, to also, you know, find because these criminals are also smart and they'll do those things through, you know, low dollar transactions. So low dollar, uh, you know, transactions are also important too, especially when they're done in the many and you can kind yeah, of correlate them together. When, 
it's interesting when you see on the spreadsheet, you can see, okay, they did like, and sometimes they're going to different machines doing like, you know, $900, but it adds up to like $10,000 in a day at at six different ATMs, you know, multiple times at each or, you know, it's a, a, they probably think they're not connected at all, but imagine too, what they're doing at different companies, ATMs. Like if we, we see all these transactions in small dollar value at one, you know, one operator's machines, the same person probably uses multiple, um, you know, machines besides numbers. Yeah. There's, there are a lot of things that these guys do in order to try to get around it. But as, as compliance professionals, you know, uh, our company, that's what we're looking for. We're looking for those things where, you know, we want to make sure that we report them. Obviously it's not our job, you know, to build the criminal case, you know, for everything, but it is Mm -hmm. our job to look for things like that. Uh, and make sure that, that we're reporting those things as appropriate. So that way someone can look into them and they can take action. And so that, that stuff is really important. Mm-hmm. Agreed. They're worth the effort. They're worth the effort. So. Even if I just tell, <laughs> I have a little, oh, sorry. Jeez, I need to learn how to. Anyway, um, I just tell people like it's worth the effort to avoid a Title 31 audit, regardless of your thoughts on the law enforcement or whether you should be helping law enforcement build their cases or not. As a business operator, you can get a big fine if you don't do it. So you got to just do it. Um, Yeah. You know, they're time consuming. I know they're time consuming. Um, Write your narratives. Yeah. Write them well. You know, the who, what, why, when, where you know, write them well. Um, and, and just like you said, remember, you're you're protecting um, your customers, you're protecting consumers, you're protecting your, the financial institution that you may work for, or your own money services business. So at the end mm-hmm. of the day, you're protecting a lot of, you know, a lot of innocent people who really just don't need to be exposed to that kind of stuff or have, you know, inadvertently, you know, kind of got pulled into that stuff. So, yeah. And the scams, you know, they're, they're, they're bad for the industry. They're the reason that we have to do all these like licenses and everything like that, or that the industry as a whole has this negative connotation and, you know, yeah, it's just, but (laughs) speaking of scams, (laughs) just kidding. But my next question, (laughs) uh, I don't think NFTs are scams at all, but you hear a lot of people saying it, I guess some can be, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of the, the art that's coming out of them. But do you see, like, I, I know there's a few ATM operators now that are offering NFTs on the kiosks. Do you see that as becoming a big market in the future? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's really, really early. It's it's probably the leading or the emerging, um, you know, early adopters are, are really trying this stuff out. So, yeah, I mean, you can see that, I think, uh, you know, there's a couple different, um, you know, like manufacturers that are actually, you know, putting that out saying, hey, our NFTs are here. Um, it'll be interesting to see how they kind of play out on the machines, you know, um, art versus securities, um, you know, and what people really feel comfortable with, with purchasing. Um, I guess my professional opinion, you know, on the whole thing is, you know, it's art if it or if it's art you know i don't, I don't know um you, you yeah they have aspects be, of <laughs> yeah you might not just want to be sitting there kind of like scrolling through and trying to buy something that you don't really know so you know being with it as early as it is you know if it's if it's just something that you're that you're buying you know as, as art i think it's one thing but i would tell people you know probably just you know like anything else do your research know what you're doing as a consumer, what you're purchasing, you know, what potential liabilities might kind of come along with that. You know, are you purchasing um, a security? Are you purchasing, I don't know, a scam? Um, yeah, you just, you just don't know. It's, it's emerging technology. There's, there's not a lot of, um, you know, regulation around it. And, um, you know, there's, there's really not, you know, hardly any compliance as far as, you know, uh, them finding things out or at least nothing that, that's required. So I think the, you know, if operators kind of do their, you know, what they should be doing is due diligence, you know, collecting up, you know, at least at the minimum, like, what did you sell it for? Who did you sell it to? Um, you know, getting some ID. I think that that's probably fine. But um, I'm hoping that somebody kind of steps up to the plate and is like, here, this is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to do it. And I think that that's, that's likely to come. Mm-hmm. 
Agreed. And uh, I do, we have to end in a few minutes here, but yeah. maybe quickly, uh, what do you think of the regulatory, what do you think is going to change or do you think there will be any changes for the regulatory landscape in like a five to 10 year, um, you know, time frame? Yeah. Uh, five, 10 years, uh, a long time out in this kind of industry, um, especially with the way how fast innovation goes. Um, and then you also have things, you know, like the executive order that, that Biden's obviously put out, um, which I don't think is necessarily a bad thing either. Um, what we have right now is we have a whole bunch of regulatory bodies that are not united. Um, and so nobody really knows, like, what are their duties to try to help regulate things? You know, so obviously this uh, this EO is, is calling, you know, like the Department of Justice, uh, the EPA. Like EPA is going to look at, like, what's the impact of, like, energy and mining um, you know, yeah, have, yeah, yeah. That's the other thing. Like, of stuff. <laughs> the well, <laughs> I know we don't have a lot of time to get into that, but I know like uh, there's there's an awesome, awesome letter that was sent to the EPA um, that really kind of you know debunked a lot of stuff that that was sent to them um, by a congressional committee, and you know they they pointed a lot of things out that I think that that were that were really good to kind of help. Um, you know, explain like how this stuff happens and, you know, what kind of energy is happening with like mining, but, you know, the SEC and, and looking at the securities of NFTs, um, you know, or their strong desire to regulate stable coins. Uh, I mean, it's really hard for me to go through and pinpoint and say like, this is where we're going to be at in like five to 10 years. But I can tell you this, there are major gaps um, really right now in regulation. And again, it goes back to, you know, not all of these major regulatory agencies are really united on what authority they have to regulate. Um, so you have like the SEC, the Department of Treasury, FINRA, they don't know. Um, and then you also have- Yeah, it's like they're all kind of vying for to be the main regulator and uh, yeah. And then you got feds versus states. And states, you know, have, have you know, really no, no clue either. So they're, they're trying to figure out like, where do they go? What, what is their job? you know, to do at the end of the day there. Mm -hmm. Well, Jeremy, thank you so much for, for this has been really a, a great conversation. Thank you. Um, where can people find you if they want to get in touch or if they want to, you know, ha have you help them with their Bitcoin ATM compliance? Yeah. Um, so personally, you can find me out there on Twitter a lot. Um, I'm at compliance punk. Um, on Twitter, you can also find me on like LinkedIn. It's underneath my name, Jeremy Snyder. And then if you're really interested from a business aspect um, and, and talking with my team or myself, um, you can find us on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, LinkedIn. We're all at BTM Compliance. And our website is www.btmcompliance.com. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And you have a great weekend. <laughs> awesome. Hey, you do the same. And thanks for having me. Thanks.